Okay, so good to see you again. Welcome to the set. Welcome to the new studio. We're going to learn. You're learning about the new studio and television distribution and so forth. We'll be learning about what's going on in your end, which is just going uh, incredibly, uh, significantly, uh, rapidly into a new dimension. And in the audience, welcome. Very, very much to conversation. Pleasure to welcome to the program today, Carter Emard. We've been, he's been a guest to Conversations a number of times in the past. He has an incredibly interesting story and uh, field of vision in terms of his work. He's the director of astrovisualization at the Hayden Planetarium with the Rose Center for Earth and, uh, Earth and Space uh, presentation. Carter, so good to see you again. Welcome to the set. Well, thanks, Harold, and uh, happy holidays. Yeah, indeed, it's, it's right here in, in the holiday. Holiday yep. season, and you've got a you've got some projecting of uh, of uh, of uh, images and so forth that you can do that give us a look into the incredible world of planetariums. But um, maybe you could, uh, in a certain sense, introduce yourself to the audience in a formal way. You're the director of astrovisualization and a member of a, a fraternity of people who are concerned with the presentation that is possible through our the world's planetariums which is a very interesting uh, development and perhaps presages a world of, uh, of, of free of presentation that's emerging cybernetically and so forth but it's um, introduce the whole field if you could well thanks Harold it's it's a it's a fairly new um, uh, endeavor that's been around for about 10 years mm. where planetariums went from a traditional medium of, of showing, displaying the stars as if you're in a sort of open field looking up uh, in a sky far away from a city yeah. uh, so that you can see the Milky Way, which uh, very few people see these days. Mm -hmm. So many people live in urban centers. Right. Um, but around 10 years ago, uh, ra really around the ten turn of the millennium, so mm -hmm. we're <laughs> uh, maybe 12, 14 years ago now, yeah. that, um, that the ability to turn that display into a video display uh -huh. run by computers allows us to <clears throat> um, present the three-dimensional layout of the universe um, and be able to actually uh, feel as though we're moving through it. Mm -hmm. And so, and what we're moving through is a plotting of real data. So where we know where stars are in the sky, yeah. sort of traditional map of the sky, which mm -hmm. was the grist of the of the tradition of planetariums. Right. Uh, we now know distances to those stars yeah. and through knowing distances to stars, distances to galaxies. And so we can put together a, a layout of the universe um, and see it for what it's worth. We can move out into that accurate star field and accurate field of galaxies. Mm -hmm. And when you do and you see that layout, um, you, you tend to turn around and sort of look back as, as the uh, Apollo astronauts did to see where we are in it. And um, I think that um, the, the science and the, the medium of, of the display and everything are shows that we create. I, I direct shows at the American Museum of Natural History um, that, um, that display this data and tell the story of the process of the universe, um, a process that we can simulate um, better and better now with increasing, increasing computer speed is uh, um, simulations of the universe and process. But in this is that we, we tend to see this broader perspective and we see ourselves in it. So yeah. we can look back at the Earth and the Earth is very tiny from the moon. Yeah. Uh, it's even just a dot if we move out into the solar system. Um, pretty soon we can only relate to our position in space as, as the light of the sun itself because the Earth has disappeared as a little pale blue dot as in the words of Carl Sagan. Um, and um, if you move farther afield, then we just see uh, our, our, recollect, our, 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 our ability to locate where we are mm -hmm. is no longer Earth or just even the sun. It just becomes the entire Milky Way galaxy. Yeah. Uh, galaxies typically have several hundred billion stars. <laughs> uh, we're finding planets at such a rate that indicate that it's not unlikely that a typical galaxy has perhaps a trillion worlds. Um, Amazing. We know of many worlds in our, in our own solar system, but we only know of one world in the entire universe that mm -hmm. has life, which is us. Um, mm -hmm. But we see literally um, uh, within our, our fields of view, we, we've mapped several million galaxies for their positions in space, um, thanks to, again, to computer speed and, and uh, surveys that have 
uh, a number of surveys that have, have, have uh, taken account of galaxies that are in the field of view and can measure distances. Mm. Um, and then um, that, that, we can extrapolate yeah, yeah, from the Hubble yeah, Deep yeah. Field yeah. that uh, there are probably several hundred billion galaxies within our view <laughs> of the universe, and we know that our view of the universe uh, is actually not the entire universe. Not at all. And Mr. So. Kasagan used to say billions and billions. Well, and 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 indeed. It, and it's so. interesting to me also, Carter, that you call that, it's the Rose Center for the official title? It's the Rose Center for Earth and Space uh, at for the American Earth, Museum of Natural for History. For Earth and Space. And you put on the shows because it's not only the tradition of the planetariums to give a view of the universe and so forth, but it's also able to take into account processes here on Earth. And those shows that you put on are putting you in touch with a lot of Whoopi Goldberg and a lot of the production facilities of the film industry and so forth. So there's a lot of blending going on we have, that we, is really interesting. And particularly mm -hmm. if you extend out the, in, the educational implications of all of that is something you're right on the cutting edge. You, you've got a very interesting position here on Spaceship Earth. Well, it's... Don't you think? <laughs> Yes, I... Do I, they pay you for this? Or uh, no? yes, you have it to is pay a, them I, to be I, in I, such I, a, an exhilarating I, I, position. I'm a staff member of the American <laughs> Museum of Natural History, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, I, I feel very honored because I was, yeah. as a child, I, I was uh, inspired by the planetarium. I started taking classes. Uh, my mother would drive me in every week uh, when I was age 10. Wow, um, really? And uh, so the, while the planetarium was inspiring to me, um, the, Apo the Apollo program was also happening. We were walking on the moon. Uh, I was uh, born in 1961, so uh, I was eight years old and remember that first walk on the moon. Um, and oh, okay, very inspiring yeah, yeah. to so many. Um, but um, it's interesting that uh, as soon as we walked on the moon once, that uh, the uh, second time around, mm -hmm. that uh, people were complaining that uh, their soap opera was being... <laughs> <laughs> uh, their evening programming was being yeah. interrupted by right. uh, a repeat of what we had done. Right. Um, so it's, it's, it's very curious how something as monumental as going to the moon suddenly yeah. becomes boring. I remember um, when he stepped on the moon. Do you remember that? I guess you oh, do. I, no, you I, have, I was in rapt attention. Yeah, I, me I've been too. Boy. fascinated my whole life. Oh, yeah, that was something else and everything. And we do live in these incredibly uh, telescoping. It seems to be time and so forth. It's like coming to some sort of a qualitative transformation, maybe even in terms of this. We're, we're coming to understand things uh, so much more in a, an age of enlightenment is almost too calm or too mild, I think. We're coming to some sort of a major understanding intellectually of the broader processes of which we've been a part. Apparently the science tells us for a couple hundred thousand years, our species is coming to a crescendo well, we, of we, understanding and we, scientifically based understanding and intelligent understanding with, of the universe and our role in it. With the trends of the technology, we are more interconnected as a species than we ever have been in the past. Right. Uh, we have access to information um, like never before. Um, we have a flood of th that capability to record more information, yeah. and that um, that 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 is just the process of our current lives. Yeah. Um, along with that, um, our armada of spacecraft that are out there visiting the planets, um, we can take that information, put that together into large planetary maps. Uh, uh, including the height maps, so that mm -hmm. uh, like Google Earth, we can you know visit yeah. any location on mm -hmm. Earth and see it. Um, Google also does Moon and Mars. Um, in a similar fashion, we do that as well within the planetarium. But um, unlike Google, which will is mainly a globe yeah. uh, as a kind of you know a construct to look at a particular globe, we show those worlds in their proper planetary context of where they are at any one given Ooh, time okay. and. And also um, to see where certain spacecraft are to show the satellites, this sort of thing, um, which is in a solar system, which is part and parcel of uh, the universe. We call this the digital universe, which okay. is a it's a data gathering and, and maintenance process. Uh, my colleague Brian Abbott at the museum maintains this this database, mm -hmm. and so it it goes from the Earth and its data sets to mm -hmm. the planets and their their data sets. Mm -hmm. Um, across the solar system, 
Um, really even, uh, we're working now with space weather, so the, the radiation environment uh, caused by living with our star, the sun, mm -hmm. and, um, and then on out into the local solar neighborhood of stars and the locations of stars that have planets, mm -hmm. which is an ever-growing, amazing uh, um, uh, set of uh, current observations. Uh, we now know of about a thousand worlds out there. Um, that number is growing all the time. Um, and then we live in this galaxy, literally, of, of uh, hundreds of billions of stars, and we can extrapolate that. Right, but right. We, we only, we have, as far as ex discrete measurement, we have uh, about 100,000 stars, mm -hmm. um, and then beyond the Milky Way galaxy, we have discreetly, uh, on the order of about two million galaxies that we've observed. Come and, a long and, uh, way from the optics of Copernicus and uh, so forth, and Kepler and all that. But, and, but yeah. complementing that, yeah. yes, yeah. and complementing yeah. that, that observation of the universe and, and having this digital universe um, sort of uh, foundation from which we do our shows, mm. that our understanding of the process of the universe and we observe um, we, we observe phenomena in the universe right. is that we are to aid our understanding of it mm. is that we have to invoke physics and, and how sure. we understand how the universe works. We invoke mm. astrophysics and we can simulate this in, in machines with ever growing speed so that our ability, our, res our resolution of those phenomena and our ability to uh, look at a simulation. It used to be that we'd just do a simulation maybe in two dimensions, yeah. but now typically we're doing them in three dimensions. Yeah. If we have the third dimension, then we can visualize yeah. this this information. That I, I call it color by numbers. Yeah, that's so right. Sort of like, you know, so that we can we can yeah. visualize that simulation and show that process, yeah. and but show it in in context yeah. to the the observed layout of the absolutely universe. That, and that's, also that's essentially what you're showing these things not only in space but you're also showing earth process and you're showing it in a way the way we perceive the environment with this planetary wraparound kind of environment that is uh, perhaps a precursor to a, a lot of communications in the everyday world is going to be carried out don't you have some things on here that you could help uh, I, Put I up on the screen to show. So you I, had think, a picture I think if we, we bring up this this um, presentation that that um, I I worked on actually uh, with our colleagues in, in Sweden, we call this movie "All We Are" for, okay. for reasons that may become apparent here. Do we want to bring the lights down or something? Um, we could maybe a little bit. Uh, that, that might be possible. Okay, but this and, is um, okay. You but but in, in the show, we start off with this, this view. Now, now, in the planetarium, you'd see this wrapped all the way around you, and this is just a sort of forward view. But this is our planet uh -huh. rising, and, and what we see uh, is uh, we see the clouds, and uh, we see the geography of Earth, and we can see, uh, essentially, the, the effect of the atmosphere. And it's yeah. accurately right. modeled here such that, that we see um, how, how thin that atmosphere is. It's only about 20 miles thick visibly to black, essentially yeah, on the daylight right, side. Right, right. And we see here Europe and, and North Africa. Yeah. We can see the Nile Delta snaking its sure. way down yeah. um, here and, mm -hmm. and uh, the Middle East and so on. But we've brought up the satellites. What and, are these um, things that are coming up now? These All are these the, words. These are the. These are actually the labels for satellites. Uh, uh -huh. we, um, these are satellites. These satellites things? around the Earth, and, uh -huh. and uh, you can see many that are just a, a few hundred kilometers off the Earth, few, a couple hundred miles off the Earth. We call this low Earth orbit. And, How many um, of those are geostationary? Geostationary is the bluish ring out there we uh -huh. just went through. And they uh -huh. hover over the equator. And Arthur C. Clarke, um, yeah. who was a great inspiration oh, uh, for our generation, sure. that, that, uh, um, 2001 The Space Odyssey, yeah, he invented the, uh, the notion of that 24-hour that orbit, uh -huh. which is 22,000 miles out from Earth. Uh -huh. And then 240,000 miles out is, is the moon. The moon yeah. is so far away, it takes light a, about... Uh, uh, just over a second to reach us. Light that's been reflected from the light of the sun. The sun is so far away, it takes about eight and a half minutes. 97 for the light. million miles? Is that uh, 97 right? million miles, yes. And in the, the moon's end, 240 uh, million, 1,000? Uh, 240,000 miles, yeah. a quarter of a million right. miles. Yeah. And the inner planets, Mercury and Venus inside the Earth's orbit, then of course we have Mars. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the Mars, Earth, uh, Venus and Mercury, the rocky inner planets, and Jupiter, Saturn, you can see the distance is growing. It takes light about four hours to get to Neptune. We also see here the trajectories for um, uh, Voyagers 1 and 2, and also Pioneers 10 and 11. People for, tend to forget about them, but we, we show them. They're going to continue on out, but that we terminate their, 
their line at about a 24 light hours, one light day away from Earth. As we move away from the sun, that uh, the sun begins to dim. We're tr we're, uh, we've we brighten the sun, but it's dimming as we're moving away. We're going to see some of the nearest stars come out to play with us here, and, and they're labeled here. Um, Alpha Centauri is about four light years away from us. Sirius, eight light years away. Vega, 26. Altair, 16. Alpha this Centauri is, this is, is our the closest? Alpha is, uh, yeah. and um, that, that we know of, and, and uh, we're looking for dim stars. These are locations for exoplanets. So th th these are locations of stars that have planets. And we put that in context now to an almost invisible sun in the center. But this sphere you see represents how far radio waves, once the Earth became radio bright uh, just before World War II, this is how far our radio bubble has extended out into interstellar space. Radio in the sense of radio, like Ra Jack Benny? Radio is, li radio. yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, even, you know, uh, um, well, early television, even broadcasts of, of uh, radar and uh, that the, the English uh, had invented. I that, so that, that little sphere represents mm. our presence of electromagnetic radiation, human generated, against the entire galaxy, which is now coming into view. And we begin to lose it because it's so tiny. We are about 25,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. The galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. Is this moving at a Several constant hundred. speed? This uh, this presentation. No, we're ex we're we're speeding up. And you speeding can see up, you okay. can see our satellites and the Magellanic mm -hmm. clouds, but. Um, uh, we go once around the galaxy, just as, as uh, we go around the sun every year. Yeah. We go around the galaxy, all the stars with us in a carousel. We go around the galaxy about every 250 million, about a quarter of a billion years. Wow, okay. And right here, those are that's Andromeda over on the left, and M33, a companion galaxy. But this represents our local group. Andromeda, although we're moving toward it, and we're going to collide around the time the sun burns out in about five billion years, that Andromeda is about two million light years away from us. Mm -hmm. Everything you see coming up now are not stars, but other galaxies. In <laughs> galaxies. Every it's galaxy staggering. here is, is, you know. And this is all accurate data stuff. This, this is all, this, yes, this is this all is the real. This is the real deal. Yes, yeah, so these yeah, are yeah. measured galaxies. Yeah. This is Brent Tully's catalog of galaxies we're seeing right now. It's a, and. Uh, um, the red areas are, are groups of galaxies that uh, are, are tight cluster associations. And as we move out farther, we, we now sort of fade in these deeper galaxies. But if we think about, the, you know, we only know of life on one planet. And now we're seeing the screen get crowded with upwards to about two million galaxies. Is that if, and every galaxy has on the order of maybe a trillion worlds. You might look a at this in a trillion worlds. And so if you look at this and just say, maybe if life is just one in a trillion world-wise, mm -hmm. worlds-wise, yeah. is that you can look at this map and say, yes, they're galaxies. But in another way to look at this is that you could look at this and say, maybe this is a map of this tapestry of life. It's mm -hmm. almost like a tissue map mm -hmm. of the universe, if you will. And that's... That's, that's projecting. We, right? that, that scientifically, yeah. we only know of life here. Yeah, that's but right. But if you just extrapolate... But probability it, it, is that there is. Yeah, probability and Mr. Sagan is, was is. looking for that with set and so forth. And, and this, this distribution you see is, is artificial in the sense that it's only where we've looked. We have not looked in those vacant areas yeah. yet. So that the sort of butterfly wings of the mm -hmm. universe, this is, this is an observational effect that we've only looked in, in catalog, you know, sections of sky, mm -hmm. limited because of the budget mm -hmm. of, of the surveys in, involved and the locations of the telescopes, uh, usually on Earth. And behind all of this, you know, I see the video is picking it up, is the cosmic microwave background. Remember I said that it takes light about a second to go from the moon to the Earth and eight mm -hmm. minutes from the sun to the Earth that in the middle of this is us. And we're observing like onion layers of time farther and farther out. We're, we're seeing increasingly a younger universe of farther away to where finally that backdrop that you see, the microwave background, represents basically the, uh, the afterglow of the Big Bang itself. Is that the Wilkinson map, the W map? Yes. The W map. They took yes. a picture. It's the surface of, the of last scattering of uh, essentially when yeah. the universe had cooled down to a point where the, uh, the photons were allowed to oh, rain so free and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the universe became dark. Yeah, and it was about 300,000 years after the creation, 13.7 right. billion years ago. That's right. And we had LISA. LISA is an array from CERN. 
Well, and they're going to take a picture he, of it if they get it in place within a nanosecond of the yes. occurrence. So that the incredible ability to take the measure but of things, the, the, my but brother. In a, in a broader sense, but in a broader sense, what it represents is that we are limited in in our look back time, essentially yeah. across the universe. To the shockwave and of the big. And the thing is, is that that uh, if you looked at some of those galaxies much farther away from us. Uh, that, that they would see a universe that was, so we're in the present and we see the, the past around us, mm. uh, of course, because the, universe, the speed of light is limited. Mm. Um, and that if you were some distant galaxy, you would, you'd be in the present, you'd see us in the past. And, and so this, uh, that we know that the universe is larger than this sort of visible sphere that is limited in space and time, essentially, mm. um, for our view. But... What you're looking at is, is the results of an, an incredible amount of work by the scientists and the survey team. This is out a there. survey of a lot of surveys. Yes, it, it's, so, yeah. this is, I, I mentioned Brentelli's name before, that's yeah. we're in close to his galaxies, but the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the two degree field survey, yeah. the two micron all sky survey, these are the galaxies that we and put in. And this is the data that you deal with. Yes, and these are academically available, freely available catalogs Wonderful. that, uh, as I mentioned, my, my, um, my colleague Brian Abbott takes yeah. and puts them into a consolidated single catalog which all uh, is all pertaining to the same uh, <coughs> Cartesian system and mm. so on. I mean, here we are coming back into the Milky Way galaxy. This now we're coming back? Yes, we went out and I, I'm, we're coming back to sort of our starting point mm. here. Um, in, in this film, All We Are. We, I did this in Norshipping, Sweden. This is mm -hmm. an involvement that uh, we have uh, hosting very talented students there for their master's thesis in that Sweden, I oversee. That, that, that was with people that are involved with planetary. Yes, and they've created uh -huh. this software working uh -huh. with me over uh -huh. the last decade uh -huh. um, called UniView, and, and it allows us as a, as a viewer, there are other viewers for this data set uh, by other planetarium vendors, but that we're all doing the same thing. We're looking at the universe essentially of data and visualizing it properly so that you see the proper constellations and the brightness of the stars, where you are in it, and that sort of thing. But as we come back, we're sort of reminding What's ourselves. What's that bright light getting That brighter? is the sun. So we, we That's we're coming back into the That's sun. right. We had flown away, and, uh -huh. and we, if we dim the sun down, mm -hmm. we can now begin to resolve just a little bit the, the orbits of the, the major planet. planets. So uh, it's coming in. See. they got to think power of 10 where they go like that, and you can see things that are very... Now, what we're doing is we're coming back in, and we'll come back in, presumably, on Earth. Yeah, yeah, so we're, here uh -huh. we are. We're coming back into our solar system, and uh, as a kind of reminder that we're in the solar system, uh, that uh, we come up here, uh, once again, we, we show the orbits, uh, the, the orbits. Yeah. Uh, you know, we get close to a planet, uh, then the orbits disappear. But, of course, this is Saturn, and you know, we fly past. And mm. Saturn's a very beautiful planet, so uh, it's just sort of uh, on our way back, we fly past uh, another planet in the solar system in, in this particular case. But um, um, the, uh, the distances are extraordinary. If you think the farthest we've ever been away from the Earth is the moon, mm. that right now we're coming up on the, moon, on the Earth, and you'll begin to see, just very dimly, you'll begin to see the, the orbit of the, the, well, we didn't even see it. There's the moon cruising out uh, to the that right. That thing that you just shot by? Yes. Mm. And, oh, uh, here we go, the blue And we come back yeah. to our, our, now our we come very down tiny to what? planet. Yeah, we come down to that. And but not only when you can... Oh, go ahead. You yeah. see it in this manner, mm -hmm. you, you realize that we are in space. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, you know, we are I, a spaceship I, Earth. I, my, fuller. I, I mean, I, my own sure. life, I've wanted to go into space and all that. But there's I, part of what this, this atlas does is make you realize mm -hmm. fundamentally that we are in space. It took the astronauts three days to go from the Earth to the moon. Yeah. And they had to travel about seven miles a second to basically get away from the Earth, escape speed, escape and get to the moon. Yeah. But we're traveling around the sun at almost three times that speed. Uh -huh. And so in the, the time be between when you wake up in the morning and when you eat lunch, mm -hmm. you've covered the distance it took the Apollo astronauts three days. Yeah, right. We're coming up on geography here. and, and Now you're uh, getting down into Earth problems. The I am. Center for Earth well, and Space. Well, yeah. right. And yeah. here we are. Earth. We're coming up on Europe. Uh -huh. This was We did this um, in Sweden. Again, mm -hmm. I was working with... Uh, um, the Linshipping University. Uh, it's about two hours south of Stockholm in the town of Norshipping. And we're going to come in on that area. So this is Sweden, and you can see Denmark over there, and Norway, uh, off near the horizon. 
but we're coming up locally in an area of Earth that might as it's sort of anywhere on Earth. It happens to be Norshipping, Sweden, where but we're coming. But it's geographically in. and visually correct. It, yes, I mean, it is. This is this the, this the this is, is Landsat correct. Seven data yeah. okay. that we're flying over right now, and as we come into the location of the city. Uh, we can begin to make out uh, the tracings of uh, humanity on the planet. Mm, okay. uh, we typically settle near water, and you can see a landing strip here. Mm -hmm. As we, we come in, we're coming into uh, this town. of Now the uh, world, as we're familiar with it, begins to come into focus. Well, the, exactly. It, this, yeah. And now, and this is we've just been all the way out to the farthest reaches of the universe. Is this and now a photographic process? Is this real? or This is, this, this uh, is real. This is from uh, an aerial, animated? No, is this okay. is an aerial overflight okay, scan right. by, um, by a process uh, developed at Saab Aerospace, but with the students from the university. And we're uh -huh. now flying over the university. Uh -huh. The Lynn Shipping University is a former mill town of North Shipping, and so uh, and uh, the university is over to the right, and we're flying up uh, the river, uh -huh. the Tala River, and uh, that uh, up here in one of these uh, buildings, the mill buildings, as uh, about two years ago, was um, a renovation of um, of this this mill building to now house one of the most sophisticated uh, dome theaters uh, for oh, data really? visualization in the world. And it's, so this is the visualization center. We're coming up on the, uh, the actual building, and several hundred year old building. And uh, we just- You're gonna go right in the window. Right oh, the this window. is like something of- So we, we come into the theater. Into the theater. Yes, uh, this is the theater the, that presumably this is the, the audience is viewing. Theater. That's right. right. And you can see it's, it's a dome. Uh -huh. And uh, that down front, uh, there's a, you know, sort of a lecture uh, ability. And so we have a, a table. This is a one meter table that we set up. And um, this is photographic. No, this is computer this, graphic, this but the, computer it's based on the actual, um, you know, the, the design model for the uh, theater itself. Uh -huh. um, the uh, theater. Christopher okay. uh, Jensen in, in uh, Sweden, who is my model maker. And my, my former student, Andreas uh, Wetterborn, you know, is, uh, uh, was my technical director. He was my student uh, three months before, and I went over there and, and we put this together between the producer Anna Ost and myself and, and uh, the That's professor. That's a cup of coffee. Anders Inerman. Yes, a, a, a typical scene here. Yeah. Um, Sweden has the largest coffee consumption in the world. Is that right? Well, uh, yeah. It's dark up there yeah. in the winters, but yeah. but a coffee cup is made for essentially your hand. Coffee tool. bean. What is that? A coffee that? bean you, that? you could hold between your fingertips. Yeah, but why all these different scales? And so We're bringing what are you we now trying? down to the micro okay. the micro sense of the universe. Here's a sesame seed which you can hold oh. on your fingertip, and uh, a grain of salt which. Uh, um, if you look at salt, you're sort of reaching the edge of human now, eye. Now, this is ability. a film. This is a this is a thing that's showing educational thing. Is this projected within a planetarium in context, a planetarium or this dome. is flat screen? We're looking well, this, at. well, this is a flat screen rendition yeah. of, uh, of a full full dome. But experience. the movie does it? Is it something that is projected on a planetarium yes, it is. surround? Yeah. Kind so of this thing? we're this now over incredible. one square millimeter. Yeah. yeah. Essentially, what mm. we're trying to do for yeah. the dome medium yeah. was was to update the powers of. Film. Right, right. And right. so here's this is a, a human egg uh, cell, which is the largest uh, that is produced by uh, humans. Uh -huh. And uh, this is a eukaryotic, typical human cell. And uh, much smaller, we have uh, the blood cell. And uh, that uh, as we as we come around uh, yet another order of, uh, of magnitude uh, smaller, we're going powers of ten. Now this is this is this Carter, is an E. coli. I'm trying to get it. If if you were E. coli. This is a flat screen. This is like a movie. Yes, but we can Now, show when you project this in a planetarium... It's wrapped around you. It, this all wraps around you. Yeah. Now, that's different than a flat screen. It makes you feel that you're in the presence of these, these objects, yes. Uh-huh. And that's... Is that what... And I've heard uh, on things we, uh, there. You got this rhinovirus. Well, okay. the rhinovirus this is viral. Okay. We're 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 coming up. There's a strand of DNA in the back, but this okay. is a mouse leukocyte. It's an antibody, and this uh. is from the protein data bank. Again, we're plotting real information, right. whereas the model of the E. coli was a a model. It was accurate in its scale and yeah. what it looks like. Okay. And in the case of the DNA and and uh, the hemoglobin we just flew past, this is from the protein data bank. Uh -huh. um, this is our state of knowledge um, for um, for these actual molecules. Is there a soundtrack like. to this? 
There is. And, the, and, it's yeah. better you're talking to well, it Well, I, I, I just thought I yeah, would guide right. us through. Uh -huh. but here, it's incredible. So this yeah. is the stick and ball configuration, typically how we, we can get our heads around the atomic distribution uh, in, in a case like in the molecule DNA. This is a thymine nucleotide we're coming into, and we're uh -huh. going to switch to a sort of vibrating, scintillating, volumetric rendition of the electron clouds. And this mm. electron cloud was was actually created for us in the University of Manchester. Mm -hmm. uh, this this represents that when 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 uh, atoms come together, they share their electron clouds, and so the, it's the, it's that which holds us together chemically mm -hmm. into the universe that uh, that we know of. Certainly here amongst ourselves and and uh, and the molecules of life and and uh, what we deal with uh, uh, on Earth. And then we're here we are coming up on um, on a, the, the nucleus of a carbon atom. Uh -huh. And if you look really close, you can see the tiny little quarks. But we remind you, looking quarks. up on the dome, uh -huh. that th this was all created in that, that in the beginning of the Big Bang. Yeah. And so we project right. that up. And so in this in this case, what we've done is we've essentially taken you through um, this this panoply of, of scales of, of the universe, and the movie starts over again on the dome inside <laughs> right. the, inside the right. inside the movie. God, that's a beautiful piece of work. You were involved in that with a whole lot of other people. Well, I, I, di I directed it. Carter uh, Emmert, I yeah. see. Sick. Okay, and, good. Uh, Anders uh, is uh, Anders Enderman is is the um, professor there who ten years ago. Um, sent me uh, students from from his uh, from his program, and we we basically uh, host an internship with the students, and they've created the software that you just saw. When when did you do that? When did you finish this? We when did this in 2010. 2010. We did it in right. four months. Yeah, and right. we did this in four months, but w it represents that we had that data of the universe because yeah. we moved through the digital universe. Right. We had that, and then uh, SKIS is the company that was formed from my students. They've enabled our ability to read the, the data sets like Landsat. Mm. And then we came in, and Andreas, uh, my, my very capable technical director, um, it was my young student uh, three, three months before he was my technical director mm -hmm. on it, but enabling this technique to then take those models of, of the city, of the building, of the theater, and so on, to where we put all that together with a flight path created to actually take where you, you flew in the, the window. But we you also had, we, you had that was yeah. like film, or that was like a filmy thing. Well, it's, that, it's, it's, that was the landscape. Yeah, I mean, it's, right. And we, we're we're using this to sort of parade through the entire range of scale of the yeah. universe to remind us that in our the coffee cup is a reminder yeah. of a sort of our daily life is that we're surrounded by. The commonplace. I mean, I'm yeah. wearing a shirt. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I walk on the street. Right, I, right. I, I live in a building. That these are constructs that that, that we relate to uh, uh, for survival. Um, but really, they're made up of atoms that are incredibly yeah. small, and and that we live as a tiny, tiny planet, you know, as in a really a tiny, tiny galaxy. If you compare that to the size of the universe, yeah, and yeah. that's the reality of our daily lives. Yeah, right. and and we know this through science. We know this through measurement. And in order to display that as a reminder that this medium allows us to sort of see that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, I think it's... The, the I think medium it's you're talking about is now... Is, is, is this, immersive, this immersive yeah. medium of the planetarium, of the planetarium. coupled with data visualization. Yeah. Because uh -huh. it's, it's an authentic, accurate depiction of the scales and relationships of of uh, what we can measure and uh, what we observe. The that universe. thing we saw flat screen. How would it have been different if we had seen it in a planetarium setting? It what would have been the different uh, visual experience or multisensorial experience? That uh, well, um, and you're you've seen both. I mean, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, um, the the dome, of course, wraps around you, so you can, yeah. you can look around. Rather like the way we encounter the world when we walk through it. Exactly. It's and not a it's slit it's in it's reality. A, sort of a sphere uh, in uh, front of yeah. us. No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the right. way you see, right? And the <laughs> exactly. planetariums come closest to recognizing that as the that's way right. and projecting that. So it's the largest, I've talked to you in the past, uh, largest video display screen yeah. in the world are our planetariums. That's right. How um, do they nest with the traditional world of uh, television, filmic expression, and what are the educational implications of uh, increasing bandwidth or increasing uh, beyond Moore's law 
capability to have digital capability to manipulate things and so forth. Where does it fit in in terms of uh, future representations of reality that could have amazing int intellectual and educational uh, relevancy to presenting the whole of understanding of Earth processes within this universe? Well, the, the, this medium uh, really... We're in television here, cable television. Sure, you and understand? we, we no. live immersed in, in uh, now, nowadays, and, you know, more and more smaller screens and people are, uh, you know, communicating through text, uh, yeah. text messaging and, and, and uh, Facebook and uh, that, we're, that we're networked with, you know, a global community like yeah. never before. Absolutely. And, and that um, the resolution of, of uh, you know, with the, these technologies is getting better and better, the uh, high definition and, and uh, retinal here. displays on mm -hmm. a Mac, say, and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, these are tremendous capabilities. Um, but in the dome of a planetarium, you're in a theater, you're, you're, in, a, you're, you're in typically a social setting. It's, and uh, yeah. that, that, um, that our, our reception for, for uh, information is, is different because we're getting, say, a presentation from a, an authority who's present in the room with us who can guide you through this information. Whereas, whereas uh, so much of the, the, the information experience today is one where people are becoming more you know, uh, private and uh, sort of sitting behind their screen. You might be talking to many people, but you have that screen interface. Mm. Um, what I like about the planetarium is that you know, it's, it, it is a, you know, it's a, it's a theatrical ex experience. It's, it's a, you're, you are sort of immersed in, in this data. The complexities of what you can present are vast. Uh, you can present just about anything with it. And so you need a narrative that really uh, will, will make that understandable. We work very hard in our show productions um, for that narrative to, to be um, thorough, yet brief, and, and uh, allow you to really sort of understand what you're looking at, but also familial and friendly. This is, this is why we typically have, um, you know, celebrity narrators who yeah, are, yeah. are known Whoopi personalities. Is Whoopi has, uh, did our um, show uh, Journey to the Stars, which is still playing. Um, you're like in but we had we've we've had Tom Hanks for the first show Passport to the Universe. We uh -huh. had Harrison Ford yeah. um, for Big our names, Search for yeah. Life. Are mm -hmm. we alone? Mm -hmm. um, the third you're show it's show was it, Robert it, Redford uh, was yeah. was, was uh, um, Cosmic Collision. So, yeah, yeah. So it, but you you sort of trust these voices. We have yeah. Liam Neeson in in uh, the Big Bang Theater, uh -huh. which is actually um, if you come to the museum and 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 just. And enter and not pay the the extra price for seeing the space show. Mm. You can walk through the lower portion of the sphere. Yeah, and that's a that's a flow. It's a walk through space. But it's about a, it's a it's a two or three minute program in mm -hmm. there where you come in and you look down and and instead of looking up at the dome, you're looking down. It's just sort of a gi giant bowl. Uh -huh. It's a short presentation, but it's it's a it's a presentation that um, attempts to really describe why why we. Th have con uh, how we have conceived this this big bang you know mm -hmm. uh, what is the evidence that 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 is that the universe began in this big bang yeah. and that astronomers in looking at at, uh, at the universe a hundred years ago noticed that that uh, galaxies uh, first we had to we had to understand that that these what what galaxies were we, yeah. we thought the universe might just be the entire Milky Way mm. and Edwin Hubble was able to get a distance fix to the Andromeda nebula as it, as it was called we didn't know whether it was gaseous and close maybe a, a solar system in the formation spiral uh, but in fact no it was like our galaxy or the milky way and it was over there it was like an island universe separated by um, you know a, a couple uh, million light years it take, takes light and you can see the Andromeda uh, galaxy, you know, on a on a fine uh, fall evening, uh, really? away from the city. If uh -huh. you look up, you'll see the Milky Way, ca uh, you know, uh, casting basically through uh, um, uh, between the, the constellation of Andromeda and Pegasus and Cassiopeia. Yeah. And then, if you if you know where to look, you can see this little. It's about the size of the moon, an elongated ellipsoid, just you know delicate glow that's 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 basically an andromeda galaxy then you're looking at light that left two million years ago you're looking at light that left before any humans walked on the planet yeah um and um beyond that uh, that's a that's one of our nearest neighbors mm -hmm. and um 
And so that, that the universe that's been revealed to us through telescopes and, yeah, and our understanding of distancing objects like Hubble distancing the Andromeda. Those Hubble photographs are amazing. Well, and the, now, now we have a telescope named for him. Yeah. But, but Hubble, the, the, the astronomer, yeah. in 1923 yeah. wow. mm. was able to... 23? In 1923, okay, yeah, using right. the 100-inch uh, 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 Hooker telescope on, on Mount Wilson, right. uh, which uh, we've filmed for our new production. Our new production is about You're cosmology. You're in production now? On we are. Yeah, okay, and, good. Um, and uh, so it's exciting to be uh, in production and working on a, a subject as vast as cosmology. But uh, um, how we understand the universe we're in and, and the dynamics and what's actually happening with uh -huh. the universe. The fact that uh, we looked out and saw galaxies all moving away from us as yeah. if we're in the center of some giant expansion. Um, that uh, this is the universe we saw and Hubble was able to get numbers for. Mm. And so in 1923 he got he got the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. Mm -hmm. By 1929, he had published um, that um, these distances to other galaxies, but we also, through others than Hubble, had been uh, like Vesto Slifer at the Lowell Observatory, actually measuring the speeds of these galaxies all away from us. Yeah. And so it, it, Hubble was able to get the distances and the speeds together. Mm. This is... With accuracy. With accurate, well, with the best accuracy yeah, at the time. Yeah, right, which has been growing all the time. The reason the Hubble telescope is named after him is that, that we were able to really put a much finer resolve to mm. that because we can see so much better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that this universe is expanding. And the, it's very interesting to note that when we looked at these vast scales, that we, we saw that, that, um, uh, that, that the universe was expanding. It indicated that the universe had begun from a time, just mm -hmm. wind the clock back, to where the universe is sort of on top of itself and, mm -hmm. and incredibly hot. Mm -hmm. And that, that very hot, dense, in fact, denser than the, the inside of a star, that the entire universe was dense and hot, was essentially this, 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 this beginning. And if you take it back to that sort of singularity, that, mm -hmm. that, that the universe sort of balloons out and expands out. Yeah, I know. It's and, amazing. And it, it is amazing. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that, that's the term. Actually, the Big Bang was a term that Fred Hoyle, yeah. astronomer mm -hmm. who derived mm -hmm. the nucleosynthetic chain within stars, a, a very reputable um, astronomer. Uh -huh. But he didn't, uh, astronomers, it didn't sit well with them that, that the universe was beginning. For, it was too much like the, the, uh, the Genesis story. Yeah, yeah. And so he said, you, you can't mean the universe began at a big bang. And so, <laughs> it's a, a derisive term, mm -hmm. but it stuck. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we also started to find out interesting things looking at uh, Zwicky, the astronomer, looking at dynamics of getting the velocities, because you get that from a Doppler measurement. Mm -hmm. you, can, you read that in the sort of barcode of, mm -hmm. of, um, of the spectrums, of, uh, if you spectrograph a galaxy, you look at it, and you can tell these velocities. And we can tell that these galaxies in clusters were moving far too fast mm -hmm. for the, the amount of mass there to hold it together gravitationally. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was a first um, observation of what we now call dark matter. Yeah, um, what is all that dark well, we, energy? Well, for a while we called it missing uh, mass, or yeah. astronomers called it missing mass. Um, and, and we now call it dark matter, um, which means that there is an invisible, there's invisible matter there. We can't see it. Yeah. We're looking for it at CERN, mm -hmm. the Higgs boson, or, you know, it's indicate sort of. Higgs boson. It's, yeah. it's, it's, we're, it, they're in, yeah, there's a lot of detail in that. Yeah. But the other thing that we saw more recently is that um, with surveys, not so much from the Hubble telescope, but ground bases, that we're able to begin to account for, remember, as we moved out, I was talking about this look back time, when you yeah. look at a galaxy farther away than a closer galaxy, we're seeing something that's younger because it's taken yeah. light longer to get to yeah. us. So we're seeing a younger and younger universe. Yeah. We're now able to look at uh, yeah. using these supernova that, that we can use as sort of a standard candle of light. Mm. You know, if, 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 we, if we filled the uh, New York City with like 25 watt bulbs, mm -hmm. you'd be able to measure discreetly like the distance to everything because you know that it's all 25 watt bulbs. Mm. So in, in a similar sense, you look out in the universe and you say if you can see something and you know exactly how bright it is, mm. and then you can actually see how, how dim it ends up on, on your telescope, you can actually calculate the 
distance mm -hmm. because the farther away it's going to be, the dimmer it's going to be. So we, we, we applied this to these supernovae that go off regularly in these, the, the, the spate of galaxies that we look at and see now. And we began to see the evidence uh, in the late 90s of dark energy, which mm -hmm. is that as the universe expands, we thought that the, 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 the totality of mass of the universe, it might be enough to cause the universe to slow down and then kind of crunch back mm -hmm. in on itself. But what we found was just the opposite, that as, as the universe gets bigger, mm -hmm. you know, spatially, that it's latent with this, this energy, this dark energy, which is causing it to actually accelerate. Mm -hmm. And which is very bizarre. Uh, we give it a term, dark energy. Um, why that is, I don't mm. know if we really know why that is any more than we know why a galaxy, yeah. uh, or why, 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 why gravity occurs and, and yeah. holds galaxies. Closing holds in on things, uh, the uncertainty principles together. and synergies and things like that. We're closing in on things, and I'm wondering if you feel like I do, that we're coming to some sort of a crescendo in terms of understanding things. Come a long way since Copernicus and Galileo and so forth. And you know the Earth-centered notion of the universe and that, we, and it's mm -hmm. just a quant, a qualitative transformation in terms of what's becoming available to us in a knowledge way about the realities of the universe and the Earth. It's an incredibly uh, fulfilling, perhaps, mo uh, moment in evolution of understanding uh, Earth processes, including human consciousness and understanding. I wonder if you sense that as well. That we're coming to a a point of not just quantitative new stage of history or something, but we're coming into some sort of a qualitative new relationship to the whole process by which um, we can understand the universe and our place in it on this spaceship. That it's a time of qualitative transformation almost on close to thinking that we may be coming toward the end of a process that began 200,000 years with the emergence of our species. Well, or that we're going to come into a new relationship in the universe in an evolutionary sense. Well, it's, it's, I wonder just how far can we... I, I, do you understand? I, like, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, it's resonatingly tantalizing to think that we're coming maybe to a position of fulfilling a whole anti-entropic function in the universe and that how punctuated equilibrium, how the new appears, well, and so forth. Well, particularly since the present is so fraught with both danger, with we, weapon systems we that have, can wipe okay, out the planet. Okay, Harold, Harold, wow. Okay, throw a lot at me here. Um, I think any kind of new realization is a sense that we know a lot, but we, we don't know everything. Um, we know of life on this planet and all its complexities is amazing. Um, we are looking for signatures out there on, you know, on Mars or perhaps Europa and Enceladus at Saturn has liquid water under its surface. Yeah. These places where water exists, we, we're, we're water beings. So we, we, but we, we haven't found life anywhere else in the universe. That's we're right. looking. Yeah, looking. And yeah. we may be on the verge of seeing some chemical signature reflected by the light of a planet uh, circling a star out there. My, my colleague and curator at uh, the museum, Ben Oppenheimer, <laughs> Has a, has a telescope to actually block the starlight on the Hale telescope, the 200 inch on Mount Palomar, mm. and uh, so that they can then look at the, the light that's reflected by various planets mm. around that star. And then if you have that light, you can then analyze it spectro uh, spectroscopically and you can look to see if they're, if they're uh, you know, the, the composition of the atmosphere. And when you do that, and they're already doing that. Uh -huh. Is that uh, you be if you find uh, you know if you find an oxygenated atmosphere that may be a signature for life. Uh, um, so th this is a very exciting time. Um, that, that, and also we can we can account for the universe in a way to sort of have a description of its evolution, and we can see out sort of to the edge with the microwave background. So we've accounted for that, but we don't know really what set that in motion. We can, we can think about that in mm. terms of these, the, actually the, the conditions on, on the, almost a quantum level, the tiniest yeah. scale that sets up the, mm. maybe the, the, the initial conditions of, of the universe and, and maybe consider, you know, I think mathematically and, and physically out on, on a limb, the, the notions of a multiverse, and Brian Green's notions. Well, that's, you know, the, 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 that's he's a spokesperson theory. for a whole number of people in string yeah. theory yeah. on this. 
which is which is very maybe interesting. Parallel universes, wormholes, all but, of that. So, it may so, be an open or closed system. We so don't know. All there's certainly a lot out there. Yeah. But I, but I, I yeah. think I, I, as far as consciousness goes, is that you know it, that, um, that that it's an amazing time for. Our, these armada of spacecraft yeah. and our robots that have gone out and are bringing us this data back. Mm. We take this in a planetarium context, an immersive reality, a mm. virtual reality sense, and create a world in which you can kind of really experience that data all around all you. Right. It's kind of like the holodeck on the Enterprise. Yeah, holodeck, uh, yeah. But, you know, that begins to be the hol 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 holography, which may be over the horizon. But I th the the atlas of the universe has an interesting sort of parallel and and, and sort of a, a sort of a, a shift of just rec recognizing where we are that occurred with the Apollo program and that is that when we went to the moon we mm -hmm. were very focused on getting yeah. to the moon mm. moon 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 mm. and then beyond to Mars and what have you we were shocked when when the, the astronauts sort of took a picture of the earth mm from the moon and we blue, saw yeah. that, that yeah and this color photograph taken by human hands it had been taken robotically before right, in fact right. it was the cover of national geographic in mm. like 67 or so um one of their their issues that year that that uh, lunar orbiter robotically would photograph the earth yeah but it was a different thing that we had humans there that were reacting of seeing our place in space. Yeah, and coming up with the term was our friend Bucky Fuller who came up, we're, we're on a spaceship. And that's... It, this is a spaceship Earth and we need an operating manual for spaceship Earth perhaps and I, I know, to I, avoid the shoals. And, and while, while we're looking for that operating manual, I think there is that realization that we are all pilots of this spaceship. Okay. We are on a spaceship. As I mentioned, we're traveling Fast, we're traveling faster around the sun than the astronauts had to travel to get to the moon. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. We're traveling about uh, four or five times that speed just going around the galaxy. Right. And we're traveling faster than that on our way to Andromeda. All things are relative insofar as its distribution in the universe. But if we find life, say, on, you know, this other planet and a fairly nearby star, mm -hmm. and then we construct some intergenerational spaceship, we send people there. I'd like to remind people that our complexities of life are such that you think you're gonna get off Star Trek fashion and walk around and, you know, in, the, in, in, the, in the cool uh, waters of that other world. And, uh, or the it's, time it's, machine. It's probably never the case because mm -hmm. We have such a symbiosis with the bacteria that are in our system and all this. We is walk it, is in it. a sea of bacteria. That's right. Yeah. And so that we, in our spacesuit, we take that with us. And uh, I, can't, I can't imagine it being very romantic to be standing there in a spacesuit, you know, on a, on a, on a beach. Yeah. And, um, and so that, that, this, that while we're on the spaceship Earth and that we quest to go farther, and I like to think of our little... Our, our um, you know, our planetarium and our yeah. ability to virtually recreate, you know, flight over Mars at yeah. very high level detail. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I want more and more. I want mm. more and more of that data. Uh -huh. we, we have to gather that. And mm -hmm. we already have a, 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 a ton of data on the Earth that hasn't been processed into that experience yet. Mm -hmm. That's part of what we do on a daily basis. But that to really live on Mars, live on the Earth, you're living in this life support structure, which you really understand because it's all engineering and if the air gets too low, you know, or, or you know, gosh, you know, if the bathroom breaks, you know, mm -hmm. what's happened on the shuttle, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you come pretty close into what your limitations are. Well, we live on life support on this planet mm -hmm. and we have to realize we have no other alternative than to live within the system that is home mm -hmm. and it's it's not a prison it's it's paradise and it's this this is the most important place for us in the universe yeah yeah well okay that's all really very very well said and uh it's uh, understandable that uh getting around to where the i can't get over the fact that this educational process that began as part of the evolutionary process of universe of uh evolution of life form on this planet that we're coming to a point of uh, qualitative transformation it could be the the fact that we have extend we have self-reflective consciousness that can ask the larger issues that probably is not 
characteristic of most of the creatures. And we also have the ability to extend our consciousness through the use of tools and technology, means of communication, and so forth, in a unique way. And now on one vector, we have weapon systems that apparently from the modeling, if they're unleashed in a spasm of hatred in a realpolitik scene world, uh, apparently would mean the end of the species, that those systems exist after 200,000 years. And on the other side, we have an incredible capability of creating synergetically a liberated order for all of humanity and all of the ecology that's equally available to us now after this trek, that we're at a time of qualitative transformation that might very well be relating us to the universe at a level transcend it to what we've been throughout the human experience and the place where all that can be put together most efficiently and most effectively in terms of it conveying to the po population of the world the realities that are before us are the planetariums which you and your colleagues are, are pioneering and I it's congratulate you enormously on the, on the educational implications of these immersive uh, uh, video uh, patterns that we are dealing with here in television and I think it's just an amazingly important educational proposition that you all are, pi are, are, are doing to uh, ward off the least uh, advantageous our aspects of human activity and to encourage the most beneficial toward a transformation that might bring us into universe at a level transcendent what we've been throughout the human experience. Our Congratulations well, and thank you well, for that. Well thank you. Our, our Thank you, and I, I appreciate that. No, it's really uh, important, Jim. Um, the complexity, we're, as a planetary species, we're, we're coming into the realization of that. Mm. I, I, uh, I, I think we came into that fairly quickly when we could see the Earthrise picture above that the moon. That was a biggie, wasn't it? Yeah. And so we spent so much effort to get, a you know, Cold War effort to sort of get to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, but really the, the, the most, uh, lasting image of it is our place in space. Yeah. And so as we begin to understand uh, more and more science, we understand this complexity interleaving yeah. of all of this. Yeah. And that that is tantamount to our survival. So we I, get to I, a Gaia sense? Well, I Do you think I, you like the love I, life? I I remain an optimist yeah. from a yeah. standpoint yeah. that yeah. if we can realize that 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 complex symbiosis that we need each other yeah yeah that we're all humans um mm -hmm. and that you know sure i mean we tend to bother each other every now and then i mean just living here in new york you know a crowded subway car i mean we, <laughs> yeah. yeah i gotta get off and somebody's in my way but you know that's that sort of thing but we all we're all participants in this yeah right and that that uh you know that uh, the op on the optimistic side you say that you can see this interdependency liberation may be at hand well this interdependency the nightmare of injustice that is seen historically realizing by the james joyce yes inter realizing interdependency may be our salvation it must be our salvation. Yeah. And, and these abilities to present the earth as, as, a, uni, as a, a unified experience. There's a tyranny. There's we can a tyranny. See it. It's we called time. It We've run out of time. We've got to get a last <laughs> handshake in for the program. Thanks Thank for you. viewing. Your pleasure, Perception Carter M. Uh, please turn in. We'll be coming back again.